Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this year's McNamara Lecture on War and Peace. I'm Ash Carter, the director of the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs here at the school. And um, it is fitting that the McNamara Lecture on War and Peace be both on the topic of today's lecture and also delivered by today's lecture. Um, Robert McNamara, for those of you who are students and memories may not hearken back this far, was a predecessor of mine as Secretary of Defense of the United States, and for that he is probably best known in the United States. But he's best known around the world as the President of the World Bank. And in his life, as in what we try to do here at the Kennedy School and certainly in my own personal life, uh, I recognize uh, that it's not possible to separate war and peace from the economic fortunes of people, their prosperity, and their sense that they have a stake in what is happening around them. And so in that sense, today's lecture reflects uh, that fact as much as it reflects the life of Robert McNamara. This lecture is made possible every year by a generous gift from the uh, Robert S. McNamara Trust represented here today or, or, or uh, by the Pastor family. We're grateful to have you here. Thank you for doing this. And I, I knew Bob uh, uh, slightly. He was getting on in age when I came of age, but he was very solicitous of younger people who had taken an interest in the same field he, he had and could not have been kinder. Um, he did wonders for the World Bank, and I'll just say not only in quantitatively in increasing its commitments from 1 billion to 13 billion, but also qualitatively, transforming it from an organization that began as all about Europe and post-war reconstruction and came to recognize that the rest of humanity needed the same kind of outreach and assistance as well. And from projects focused on infrastructure uh, to projects that were more human-centered. And Bob oversaw both of, of those. And so it's very much in the tradition of who he was that we had this lecture. To conduct this lecture and to introduce our distinguished speaker tonight, we have Doug Elmendorf, the superb dean of this school. And I want to say just two things about Doug Elmendorf. The first is I wouldn't be here without Doug Elmendorf. It was Doug and our conversations that began uh, earlier this year that led to my coming to the Kennedy School, and I'm very grateful for that, and he was a wonderful partner and uh, uh, recruiter to this school. And so I wouldn't be here without Doug, and I'm very glad to be here because of Doug. Uh, he's a great leader for this institution. He's also a distinguished public servant in his own right, and therefore is just the right person to in to introduce the distinguished public servant who is our McNamara lecture this evening. So let me introduce the dean of our school, Doug Elmendorf. Doug. Thank you. Oh, oh. Yeah. Thank you, Ash, and good evening, everyone. I am very pleased to be introducing this year's McNamara lecturer, Kristalina Georgieva. Dr. Georgieva is the Chief Executive Officer of the World Bank. The World Bank's mission is to reduce poverty and to build shared and sustainable growth and prosperity in developing countries. To advance that mission, the bank provides a combination of financial and technical assistance, including low interest loans and grants, along with research, analysis, and policy advice. That financial and technical assistance supports investments in education, health, public administration, infrastructure, agriculture, environmental resource management, and more. Dr. Georgieva became CEO of the World Bank at the beginning of this year, 
Uh, even before taking her current position, she had a long and distinguished career in the global arena. And I will provide only the briefest uh, snapshot of all that she has done. Uh, she is a native of Sofia, Bulgaria, and holds a PhD in economic science and a master's degree in political economy and sociology. She first came to the World Bank in 1993 to work on environmental issues. Ultimately, she became a director for sustainable development at the bank, where she was responsible for policy and lending operations in infrastructure, urban development, agriculture, and environmental and social development, including support to fragile and conflict-affected countries. In this role, she managed about 60% of the bank's very large lending operations. In 2010, uh, Dr. Georgieva left the World Bank to become Commissioner of the European Union for International Cooperation, Humanitarian Aid, and Crisis Response. She drove a tripling in funding to address the refugee crisis in Europe. Uh, then she became Vice President of the European Commission for Budget and Human Resources, and she returned to the World Bank this past January. We are truly very fortunate to have her with us tonight to offer her perspectives on as she titled her lecture, Handle with Care, Fragile Proofing in an Age of Instability. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Dr. Kristalina Georgieva. Thank you very much, uh, Dean. Thank you, Secretary Carter. Uh, very humbled to be uh, here to honor one of the most impactful presidents of the World Bank, uh, and also to be able to come across another very impactful president of the World Bank, President Bob Zelik, uh, right there. He, <laughs> President uh, McNamara set the World Bank on a course to eradicate poverty and President Bob Zelik had the uh, fortune, the duty, to deal with the most severe economic crisis since the Second World War, since the uh, Depression, but also since the war. And in that sense, to make sure that the bank remains true to its core mission. So when we look back, when President McNamara finished his uh, service in 1981. Poverty in the world was so dramatically high. At that time, 1.9 billion people, and that is 42% of the population of our planet, uh, 4.5 billion, lived in poverty. And here are today, poverty has shrunk so significantly to 800 million people out of our 7.3 billion population. And of course, we look around, we now live longer lives, we are healthier, we are wealthier. Uh, some of us in this room, uh, because of advance advancements in technology, are going to live to be 120, which sounds great until you realize you have to work until you are 100 to get your <laughs> pension. But when we talk about this trend of reduction in poverty and the average improvements in life, it is worth pausing and remembering, as my professor of statistics used to say about averages, you put your head in the refrigerator, you put your feet in the oven, your temperature is average, but you are dead. <laughs> behind, behind the averages, we ought to recognize a very ugly trend in far too many places. And it is where extreme poverty is not only not shrinking, it is actually growing and in some countries growing dramatically. And we can see the reasons for that in front of our eyes. The first and most significant and also most cruel wars. 
Unfortunately, the footprint, footprint of conflict has grown in the last decade. When I was commissioner for humanitarian aid in the first five years of this decade, I had a front row seat in the most dramatic emergencies on this planet, from the earthquake in Haiti, through wars in Syria, Yemen, to famine in the Horn of Africa. And what was so very obvious is that where there is war, misery and destitution follow. In 12 countries, the share of people living in extreme poverty has gone up. In 18, up more than 1%, I should add. In 18 countries, the share of people living in poverty has gone down or remained the same, but num the number of people living in poverty has shot up because of population growth. And that takes me to the uh, second reason why extreme poverty is on the increase. And it is population jumping in places that can least afford that increase. And I want to tell you a little story. In, um, in one of my visits um, in uh, the uh, Sahel, uh, I was talking to people about an impression I had actually in a neighboring region in, in, uh, in Kenya around population growth. My country, Bulgaria, and Kenya in 1960 were right next to each other in the population tables. Kenya had 8.1 million people, Bulgaria had 7.9. Today, Kenya has 47 million people. Bulgaria has 7.3, officially probably less. So we have a demographic problem of our own. But what I told to the, uh, to the government of Niger at that time was, I cannot imagine my country today functioning with 47 million people. And if you look across the countries where population growth is in the 3% uh, range, many of them barely can get up to 3% economic growth. What does that mean? They're destined to have an increase in extreme poverty. And then comes one of the most dramatic challenges that we all face, climate change. It hammers poor countries disproportionately hard. If you look at the extreme weather over the last years, time and again, it would devastate already impoverished populations whether it is the famine that this year affected South Sudan, Somalia, Yemen, the northern part of Nigeria, or it is the devastating monsoons that hit India, or it is the impact of Hurricane Irma and Maria, time and again it is the poorest people that are most severely hit. Uh, you take a middle income uh, country uh, like Antigua and Barbuda, they're wiped out. You look at Dominica, it lost 200% of GDP in 24 hours. And then comes the most painful of drivers of extreme poverty for those of us who work on development because it is induced by us people, bad governance and corruption. Zimbabwe has no reason to be poor. Haiti has no reason to be very different from the Dominican Republic, but they are, and fundamentally they are because of bad governance. So when we take the world of fragility. Yes, it can be everywhere. I was uh, in 2011 on the plane going to Japan when Japan was hit by a triple disaster. 
and Japan had to receive humanitarian assistance from the rest of the world. But countries that are wealthier with better institutions, they can withstand these shocks much better. Poor countries, fragile countries cannot. So what is it that we need to do? For us in the bank, it means four very important actions we are taking. Some of them actually originate in the times when uh, Robert McNamara defined the mission for the bank to eradicate uh, poverty. The first and most critical one is to concentrate on fragile states, concentrate on the most vulnerable with everything we have. This year, we were very lucky to receive largest ever increase of our fund for the poor. $75 billion for what we call International Development Association, money that goes for the poor countries. In comparison, when Bob was the president of the bank, uh, the replenishment of FIDA was 50 billion. And that 50% jump is for one reason only, so we can do more where it matters the most. We are significantly increasing funding for fragile states. Uh, most importantly, we are increasing our presence in fragile states and our staying power in, in fragile states. Uh, we usually imagine World Bank staffs, uh, staff like, uh, like the dean, suits, tie, walk in the high corridors of power, what we have now more and more when we talk about uh, bank staff is Lang Pritchett. Lang, stand up so people can see you. People who actually put their boots, roll their sleeves, they are in communities, they make everything possible for communities to be empowered, to be able to get their voices heard in the high corridors of power, to get the World Bank to be an ally of the most vulnerable, the most uh, destitute. We also have embraced something that I believe is absolutely paramount if we want to deal with fragility on a scale, and it is gender equality, more power to the women. Uh, I remember another president of the bank, Jim Wolfenson, once when we had a very difficult problem, turning to me and saying, Kristalina, so much work to do and so very few women to do it. And it is time and again, any place you go, you give women access to finance, ownership of land, right to vote, and very good things happen. My favorite uh, memory is uh, as a commissioner for humanitarian aid, that was not from the bank, but still very relevant. Uh, we were providing uh, small monthly uh, funding to women so they can buy seeds and tools and basically sustain their families. And I'm visiting a village, meeting with the men and the women, and I, I asked the men, I said, you know, how did you feel when we gave the money to the, to the women? And one of the men said, you know, I didn't like it at all, but if you were to give me the money, I would have bought a bicycle and we would have been starving. So gender equality is uh, fantastic economics, it contributes to more peaceful societies, but it does one more thing, and it is trimming down this incredible population growth I was talking about. You get girls in school, you keep them there, they graduate, marry when they are mature, have fewer children, contribute to their economy. All in all, you have a much better chance to fight poverty, and to build resilience in societies. Uh, let me ask you a question. How was your day today? Good? Great? Okay. On this great day of ours, 41,000 girls somewhere in the developing world got married under the age of 18, many of them against their will eradicating early marriage. This one step alone would bring probably around two billion, uh, sorry, two trillion dollars in economic benefits. And people smarter than me say that the whole uh, swing of things around gender equality, if it was to be achieved, would have meant 
around 12 to 28 trillion dollars more GDP on our planet. Let's assume this is wrong. Let's assume it is 10 billion. And it is a trillion, it is five trillion. We need just about that to make sure that all needs of the most destitute people are met. Uh, so that is for us a hugely important thing. The second issue we focus on, so we focus on, frag on, on fragile states and empowering uh, communities and especially women. The second thing we focus on is actually overcoming a um, uh, theology we had in humanitarian and development action for quite some time, which goes like this. When there is an emergency, it is for the Red Cross and the humanitarian uh, community to come save lives. Then they withdraw and then the development people step in. No more. One, emergencies are protracted or repetitive. Crisis lasts a long, long time. Take Syria, seven years of war, formerly middle-income country, now is uh, down to over 60% people in poverty. When the war is going to last, we can only, only guess, but say it lasts only a day from today. To reconstruct this country, it would take a long, long time. If the development community is to wait until the war is over, the military is, uh, is leaving, and then to step in, we would lose valuable time and very likely we may even lose the people who roll their sleeves to, to try to rebuild their country. While the humanitarian operations are in place, we ought to be there. We are now in Yemen, we are in Somalia, we are in Iraq, we are in Afghanistan, we are in Mali, we are in all these places working together with the humanitarian community. They have more tolerance for insecurity, they are in very dangerous places, we have better understanding of long-term sustainability. We can target poverty alleviation actions better, use money more wisely. The third thing that has changed dramatically uh, for, for us is how we approach climate action. We have been on the forefront or, or on climate action for quite some time. We started when it was not yet fashionable. It was actually, and I, I would brag to my former boss, to Bob about it. It was in my office at the World Bank in 99, before his presidency, when we invented carbon trade. The very first prototype carbon fund was done at the bank. And at that time, people were saying, what's that? It's never gonna work. It does work. But more importantly, we have been trying to bring the whole world up on, cri on climate action, except that we have not been focused enough to take forward climate action from the perspective of the poorest and most vulnerable. And what does that mean? It means that on mitigation for poor people, this is access to clean energy, but much more importantly, Adapting to climate change is what poor communities and poor countries need. And yet today, we account for mitigation higher in climate action than we account for adaptation. There is bias toward mitigation, which of course is overall a very good thing for the developed, for the more developed world. But it is a terrible thing when we talk about Niger or Chad or Mali. Correcting this is crucially important. Let me finish with one thing that for us at the bank in this world of fragility is most important, more important than anything. And you know, you would be surprised, but I would even say more important than even gender equality. And it is success of collective action, working together, working as one community. I cannot think of any problem that is related to fragility that a single country can solve on its own, not one. So here are our choices. There are two, one is realistic and the other one is fantastic. The realistic choice is extraterrestrials would come from space, make us work together. And the fantastic is we people would do it ourselves. So 
we see it as our mission at the bank to actually swap the places of those two and make sure that we together, we together make what Robert McNamara dreamt of, a just world where he called it absolute poverty, does not exist anymore. And that is the world I'm sure we ask ourselves we all want to live in. Thank you. Thank you so much for those wonderful remarks. Uh, now it's your turn uh, to ask questions if you would like, and I have some I'm happy to ask myself, but, but you're the people who are in the driver's seat here. We have microphones uh, on both sides down here and microphones up in the balconies. Um, it's your chance to ask uh, questions about the things that uh, Dr. Georgieva has said to us or the things she didn't say that you wished she had talked about. And uh, our tradition in the forum is that when you ask a question, you have to start by saying who you are and uh, you have to ask uh, briefly and you have to end uh, the question with a question mark, which is how you know it's actually a question. Please. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, my name is Hodan Osman. I'm a um, HKS student here in mid-career, and I'm from Somalia. Um, and my question to you is, um, I think we'd be looking at IDA and the increase of funding towards fragile states and this new focus on fragile states. Um, but being on the ground for the past five years there, what I'm wondering is like, how does that actually translate to actual work on the ground? Because you still have these project pads that are 200 pages and you know lead times that are 18 to 24 months long and practice leads that sit in Washington. So how do all of this kind of actually translate into actual implementation on the ground? Thank you. One by one or you can take one, okay. one at a time. Let me tell you, yeah. this is a great question. I love your asking it. Uh, look, um, you're right. Oh, thank you. You're, you're so very right. We have a history of being uh, rather careful in what we do. Uh, for, for fairness to the bank, we are a lender of last resort. We lend to people nobody else lends to, so we do have to be extra car careful, but it doesn't mean we have to be bureaucratic. One of the great things in my job is that it is my job to make the bank more agile, more adaptable, faster. And so I'll give you examples. Somalia. So we have the famine hitting. Somalia is a country with arrears to the World Bank, so we can't really lend to Somalia. So we are building a program, $1.8 billion program for the affected countries, but in the program there is nothing on Somalia because it isn't in arrears. So I brought my, 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 my guys and I said, look, this is morally wrong, and it is also destabilizing a country that is struggling to get on its feet, so we have to find a solution. And then we found the solution. We took money from a particular fund funding arrangement within 48 hours. Within two weeks, the 50 million was already in the hands of ICRC, our partner in Somalia. Why ICRC? Because they're physically in Al-Shabaab controlled areas. If you want children and women and men to survive, you have to fund everywhere. But what is the contribution of the bank? As land would know very well, even in countries we don't work so actively, we do poverty assessments and we can target. We know actually how to do effective social uh, protection. Uh, and we did that together with, uh, with the um, ICRC, including identifying where we can build wells so there is more independent water supply, what are the best ways to provide the uh, the assistance uh, rather than just distributing food. How you can get, how, how can you help people to help themselves? So, and, and or, or we just got in Yemen, cholera, cholera hitting. We did within a month, a very large operation, 200 million, to make sure that we get clean water supplies and treatment centers, we got a thousand running very quickly. And while unfortunately mortality is still going 
up, uh, morbidity is going up, mortality is dropping. In other words, people are still getting sick, but they're not dying. And we did that very, very, very quickly. You cannot work in fragile states with 24 months time horizon. You, uh, you know, that's, that's impossible. So we are changing, not only in, in a sense of getting people there, delegating to, to them, but in, in the way we think about speed, the world is changing very rapidly. We cannot possibly operate in the 21st century the way we did it in the 20th century. And I would say that it gives me great boost that I spent these years as humanitarian commissioner. It made me, it actually made me a better person because when you face the tragedies, the immediacy of death, uh, then, then you say, oh God, you know, 200, pa uh, 200 pages, Pat, forget it. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, I'm Yash, a freshman at the college. Uh, and I was just wondering, as someone who's just starting um, their, their studies, what would you advise me to study? What would you advise me to get involved with if I seek to make like a positive impact uh, in the world? And I guess not just academically, but also outside of the classroom. What would you advise someone in my position to get involved with? Well, the, the, the first advice I would give uh, to people who would like to be involved in uh, development is try to be part of a project where you can see with your eyes, you can engage directly uh, and understand how an impactful operation actually works. Um, those who, I mean, obviously reading and, and, and studying is a great thing, but there is no substitute. If you want to understand development, you ought to become part of action somewhere. I myself felt in love with the World Bank when I joined and I was part of a team that was phasing out leaded gasoline in Eastern Europe. And, you know, I got engaged. I was in uh, very dirty refineries and followed the pathway of leaded gasoline and how you can get rid of it. In 18 months it was done, but that there is no substitute for being part of, of action. And you know, you want some action? Hey, we have internships at the World Bank. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Up here. Hi, um, my name is Ted Wechter. I'm a senior at the college. And underlying a lot of the different things you've talked about is economic instability. And indeed, a lot of folks will say that um, our global economy is more than ever vulnerable to huge shocks because of the way economic production has been concentrated in very limited geographical areas and in the hands of a few huge transnational corporations. Um, and so I'm wondering what is the World Bank, how is the World Bank addressing this economic instability that underlies so many of the other problems? And also, you know, do you worry that because of the neoliberal economic reforms that have been imposed by the World Bank on countries of the global south, you know, deregulation, privatization, that this has actually contributed to this huge concentration of product, like, uh, uh, production in the hands of a few corporations, and you're therefore actually, in some ways, addressing a problem that you yourself helped create. Well, it is a very fair question, because there was time in the history of the World Bank when we were overly concentrated on what in economics would be called uh, let the tide lift all boats. Uh, but then we discovered that if you don't have a boat or if there is a hurricane in and washes away your boat, that is not a very useful theory. So then we worked on adjusting that and, re and, and, and bringing in aspects of development that are making sure people are educated, they have the skills to take charge of their lives, making sure that there is equality of treatment, that taxation is uh, uh, fair and allows public services to be, to be funded. In many of the most fragile countries, one of our preoccupations is how to make sure that there is budget based on taxing these very corporations you talk about in a fair manner. Uh, right now in, in, in Somalia, 
uh, our preoccupation is to start working in Somalia. Number one on priority on our list is to have a taxation system so Coca-Cola in Somalia would pay taxes to the Somali government. Uh, so they, while I recognize that we do have the history of, of, of a bit uh, kind of ideologically perhaps uh, slightly unrealistic uh, twist, that, that was in the 80s. Uh, we <laughs> it is not your grandfather's World Bank <laughs> anymore. Uh, the bank, the bank is much more. Today, the bank is much more more concentrated on on inequalities, on fairness, and on on lifting up people that are falling uh, behind. And when it comes down to uh, the fragile states I talked about, to be to be to be honest, the big corporations is far, far, far from being their biggest uh, problem. You take South Sudan. South Sudan, uh, in poverty in South Sudan jumped from 45% to 71%. Why? Because of a conflict. And actually we are much more worried about the inability of regional powers of global community to be concentrated on the most dramatic conflicts of today because this is what is killing most people and creating most uh, instability. Um, as for the, uh, for the future of uh, our global economy, uh, yes, we are much more shock prone than we were before. And yes, we do need to worry about uh, inequalities. Um, we are like, like fish in a fishbowl. We all know what is happening, how, how other people live. And, and our, the aspirations we have they converge, but the opportunities in some places diverge. And we, again, I'm, I'm, I'm stressing this very strongly. The philosophy of development we embrace at the bank is based on these decades of experience, including on mistakes we have made. Thank you. Um, first up here, and then we'll come down. Hi, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Yi Hao, uh, and uh, I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. Uh, before coming to the Kennedy School, I worked in the World Bank for two years. Uh, so, so it's nice to see you. Uh, so uh, m my so question is that how, how do you intend to make the World Bank work more efficiently while uh, going through due processes such as checking all the boxes on, 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 on social production, on environment, and having virtually all the projects being approved by the board? How do you intend to improve, improve that? Yep. Thank you. Uh, first, uh, I would make an assumption that you have not left the bank because I came there. <laughs> <laughs> um, second, uh, we, we do put in place new instruments that help us to accelerate delivery to our clients. For example, we just passed, this is part of Agile Bank, we passed two new instruments that are straight answering your question. One is called multi-faced approach. We go to the board once, we say, for the next 15 years, this is what we project to do. So here is the approach we are taking, and then we discuss it, we go away, and then we have predictability of 15, 10, 15 years, whatever is the duration. We, st we slice it in phases, but we don't go to, to the board anymore unless something very dramatically changes. Uh, and that, of course, as you can imagine, took a lot of wrestling with the board until they believe that we are, we are not doing it uh, to avoid responsibility. We are doing it because speed and adaptability matter. The second instrument we passed is delegated restructuring. When you were in the bank, you probably have seen one of the biggest pains in the butt for bank staff <laughs> is if they have to restructure a project. Absolutely. C circumstances change, they have to restructure, go to board. Now this going to board is out. We are delegating restructuring to the vice presidents, to the operational uh, managers, and again we had to convince the board we are serious, and the way we convince, are convincing the board is by saying, to put it very simply, we are legally agile. 
In other words, we know we have to respect the environment and we have to respect the rights of communities. And we will do that. But don't ask for all T's to be crossed and all I's to be dotted, because in this very fast world of ours, by the time we do it, what we are, doing, what we are proposing is already outdated. And uh, you know, the board, so far, so good. They are, they are subscribing to, to it. But I would admit that part of the problem is us, bank staff. We are overly conservative and cautious. Uh, everybody who has worked in the bank knows that very often there is more room for interpretation than we make use of. And this is actually where the big culture change in the bank uh, has to happen. And this is what we are driving uh, day in, day out. Believe in yourself, do the right thing, apply judgment. Use your common sense. Problem? Most common thing about common sense? Not very common. <laughs> How you build it? It is by leadership, leadership uh, uh, kind of marching and setting up the right example, which we do. That Come sounds back. very encouraging. Thank you. Thank you. Come back. Yeah. <laughs> I will. Over here, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is King Sering. I'm from the Kingdom of Bhutan and Ash Fellow uh, Center uh, at, at Ash Center right now. Uh, being from Bhutan, a small country, we realize that uh, it is difficult to get investments, including that from the World Bank. Even though we are the only sort of the uh, carbon negative so-called country in the world, and also the only country in the world that has been authorized, I believe, by the World Bank to use our own procurement rules. So my question to you, ma'am, is what are you doing for the small, fragile states? Thank you. Um, thank you for being here. You are also the uh, only country that measures national, gross national happiness. Um, what we do is now we have more IDA money, and we can do much more. I met with the uh, uh, prime minister of Bhutan uh, in uh, New York. Uh, and actually, I'll tell you a little anecdote. Um, the word, and I'm sorry I don't have it right here, but we have our pin, our sustainable development pin that has in the middle end poverty. So he saw me with this pin and said, oh, very good. I didn't like the other pin because there is a hole in the middle. And do you know the uh, sustainable development pin? A, a circle that has all the colors, the, the sustainable development goals. So he says, I don't like it because this is like zero, and zero is not a good thing. Mm -hmm. So I gave him my, my pin, he, he had it with him, and we had a very good discussion about poverty and about actions we can take together in Bhutan, but also globally as a global community. Uh, so we are doing more. And <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sarah Shimun. I'm a freshman at the college. Um, my question just has to do with, you know, as you're talking about uh, changing technology and how, you know, you're the World Bank of the 21st century is not the World Bank of the, tw of the 20th. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about uh, renewable energy and the way that policy is shifting mm -hmm. around that from your position in the World Bank, but also in the greater global community. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, uh, re renewable energy uh, dominates our energy portfolio for obvious reasons. and um, we have progressed in the following way. We used to fund large-scale renewable energy uh, projects as well as off-grid renewable energy. Now we are concentrating more on funding uh, regulatory framework and then barriers for renewable energy to take place. Why? Because now uh, private sector is completely uh, capable of funding uh, projects, costs have gone down, profitability, revenues have gone up. Uh, just recently in Vietnam, we had on the books, we were preparing a $500 million project for solar and wind. I mean, believe it or not, here is Vietnam, plenty of sun, no solar. I lived in Belgium, very little sun, a lot of solar, go figure. So in Vietnam, our initial idea was we would fund the uh, regulation, batteries, transmission, and production. 
And then we met with private sector. Private sector is saying, well, if there is regulation and batteries and transmission, we will fund it massively. So we shrank our project from 500 to 100 million. We do only what is absolutely necessary and we expect very good things. We have massive investment in renewables in Africa, massive, massive, to a point that we are running out of projects to, uh, to, to do ourselves. Uh, but luckily we see a big pickup uh, from the uh, private sector. And I wanna stress something actually going back to the uh, question around what is, what is our role? Our role is to create the enabling environment for, for, this, uh, for this to happen. In China, some years ago, we funded mini, mini, mini grant, 14, well, 14 million is not mini, mini, but for China it is mini. And this 14 million grant created the conditions for $80 billion solar production industry in China. So that's what we do. Thank you very much. Up here now. Hello. Uh, it's, first of all, it's an honor to have you here. I'm Nico. <coughs> I'm from um, Cancun, Mexico. And in the uh, you know, recent uh, U.S. presidential election, there was a lot of re uh, emphasis on uh, immigration, uh, the drug trade, and you know, perhaps more importantly, violence in Latin America. Uh, so uh, I, was, I was wondering uh, if the World Bank uh, had any plans to uh, you know, work on that ongoing issue of violence in Latin America. Uh, I personally have worked uh, back home with mm -hmm. uh, a Latin American initiative of creating a Latin American university to professionalize the police force uh, in order to that, so that the police knows how to respond to certain, you know, situations, but also that they pursue higher uh, education and, and, you know, more studies. And just to bring like a greater sense of professionalism and, you know, to decrease the sense of uh, a narco war going on and just bring a more uh, a sense of a greater uh, peace and stability. Mm. Uh, well, actually, the team that works in the bank on fragility is called Fragility, Conflict, and Violence, exactly for this reason, because in some parts of the world, violence is what destroys uh, communities' uh, lives and livelihoods. What we do are two things. One is, uh, as with many other aspects around fragility, we do the economic analysis and costing. So policymakers can take informed decisions as to what is it that it costs them. Uh, the uh, the uh, cost of conflict and violence, uh, annually, conflict and violence, is $14 trillion. This is a huge, huge uh, imposition on societies. But then we take that and we go granulate in countries where this is a massive problem. We in Actually, Latin America is where we have the bulk of our work for a very unfortunate reason, because of the uh, massively spread uh, violence. And we have uh, lots of projects, mostly community-based community, community -based projects, where we, we work on, on identifying the reasons for violence and then having interventions that would, that would help uh, the community to come stronger. Um, so, and thank you for the work you do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Madam Kyrgyeva, I'm Nadia Stoyanov a little. I'm uh, from Bulgaria, Sofia as well, and I'm also a Bentley University alumna. It's a, a very rare privilege to have you here today. Thank you so much. Um, my question is about the new sense of ethics in the world that we live in, um, having in mind all the counter forces of fake news, global interest to politicize questions that are not necessarily easily solved when being politicized. Um, where do you see the role of the uh, World Bank in that respect? Um, chartering or broker brokering agreements and uh, consensus around um, enforcing the rule of law, um, integrity, uh, honesty. You work with so many partners from the nonprofit as well as commercial sector. Thank you. Uh, great, to, great to have a fellow Bulgarian. Um, with no disregard and disrespect to Bulgarian men, but Bulgarian women are awesome, <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> um, we, we uh, at, at, at the bank, what, what we have observed massively is that in any society, even in, in conflict uh, teared uh, society, there are lots of very good people and there is a, uh, there is a lot of very good uh, work, people helping each other, 
building a more peaceful environment. The problem is that hate is very loud. Goodness is very quiet. And that our job partially in the bank is to try to capture this voice of, of goodness, to amplify it so better things can, can happen. We have gone a long way as an institution to try to understand the drivers of any behavior, good and bad, and then to build on this understanding what are the policy choices, what are the, the um, engagement strategies that would help to move towards a you know, better society. Um, and I would say for us, uh, the last uh, 20 years have been quite, uh, quite interesting because this is the time when the bank got populated not just by economists, of which we had plenty, but also anthropologists, sociologists, environmentalists. And that closeness to, 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 to getting the, the importance of values and ethics and morals and respect, uh, that is something that is now more in the DNA of, of the bank. Uh, the bank I came to was much more monolithic. Where was the uh, question on, you know, you gave all this bad, bad advice. Uh, and there was a reason for that because this mono monolithic to a point, it, it, it was kind of scary. Uh, Land, when did you go to the bank? When did you join the world? 87? Okay, so you know this time. You walk in the bank, everybody, dark suit, men primarily, all economists, 90% of the managers in the bank belong to the same personality type. They, you know, select each other. Introvert, judgmental. And that led to, <laughs> no, it's a fact. That led to a particular institution. And then came Jim Wolferson, shook this up. Um, and now we have an institution that, that is more, more humane and much more oriented to economics is very important but morals and ethics and values are equally uh, important. And we try to, again, capture this and, 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 and lift it up in the programs we, we support. I know you're going to say enough in questions. I was- So we're so we are, we are running uh, low on time. So why don't we collect a few questions yeah, okay. and then Dr. Georgieva can respond to them as a group. So Thank you. please. Thank you for being here. I'm Sonica, I'm a freshman at the college, and I'm thinking of studying global health and health policy as a secondary concentration. So I'm wondering how you see health care and health equity as playing a role in the World Bank's role in development in the upcoming century, especially. Thank okay. you. Uh, and one up here. Hello, I'm David Natare, a Honduran student here at the Canadian School. Um, as part of its operation, the World Bank have partnerships with the private sector of each country where it works. And most of these partnerships uh, have amazing results, but not all of them, unfortunately. So how is the World Bank addressing those cases in which local communities are affected by operations that in which the World Bank is an investor or a lender, given that as an international institution, the World Bank cannot be sued? So I want to know what is proactively doing. And then I think the last question we're trying to take is over here. Thank you. Hi, my name is Yasmin. I'm at the mid-career program here in HKS. I'm from Egypt, and I have a question about what do you think of the Ethiopian dam and the water policy going forward in Egypt, depending on the Nile as a primary source of our water? Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Would you like to answer those yeah, three? Okay. I think that's yep. maybe uh, all we have time uh, for. Health, health at the World Bank. Uh, our concentration when we talk about health is um, to have health policies that are oriented towards health outcomes. And I would say the same for education. Not just getting uh, sick people in hospitals, but making sure that they actually get the right uh, treatment. Uh, we are also looking at ways in which we can um, modernize the way health is being funded. Uh, and that is to say we do assessments of, of the uh, public budgets and where private funding can be appropriately uh, applied. In terms of uh, focus on diseases, uh, we are particularly uh, interested in pandemics and we do lots of simulations on what a pandemic, what are the risks, 
what, what we can do. We recently issued the first ever pandemics bond. In other words, sharing the risk of pandemics between people with money who are seeking high returns and donors. So if you invest $100 in a pandemic bond, as a bondholder, you would get very big return, $11 on your 100. But if there is pandemics, we take your money, we fund the action, you, you, you know, you pee, you, you drink a cold water um, for the rest of your money. But that is fair. We want to make the financial markets to do what rich people so successfully do, to use them to reduce their, their risks uh, uh, of shocks. Uh, how do we do uh, affected, how do we help affected um, uh, communities if our project is the cause of some uh, of, of suffering? Uh, first, we have a very rigorous uh, mechanism for people to seek a way to be protected. In other words, to go and complain and get, get, uh, get hurt. And then second, if there is something we have done, we then can apply additional financing to fix what the problem is. Uh, and we do that in, in some cases, including we sometimes would raise concessional funds or donor funds if we feel that there is a particular problem that somehow is connected to the work of the bank. Uh, dams. We, since the uh, Dams Commission report, we are incredibly careful how we engage in uh, any, anything that is related to to dams, we concentrate on doing it right, having a proper implementation fr framework in place and making sure that there is a, uh, a due care for the affected communities or other countries that may be, that may be, that may be um, affected. So uh, we do dams only when we are 150% convinced that it is the right thing to do and we can do it right. Uh, as for the specific, uh, I don't think we are funding, we are funders. No, but I mean, doing it in the future. Yeah. Uh, so ah, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't hear, I didn't hear exactly well. Uh, you, you can always turn to the international community, including the, to, the, to the World Bank, for an analysis, uh, and usually we take that, uh, that uh, on, on us. But I'm not aware of this being uh, presented to the bank. I'm looking at my colleagues. We can follow up with you, with you afterwards uh, for more. And I can see that the, the, the lights are dimming. That is to no, say... The spotlight is <laughs> still on you. <laughs> okay. but, but I'm afraid we are out of time. This has been a wonderfully informative and inspiring hour. Thank you, Dosh, so much, Dr. Yorgeva, for coming. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anybody interested in a job at the bank? I have two colleagues here on the front <laughs> row. Make sure to leave your to leave your cards with us. <laughs>